Coming up today on David versus Goliath. It's the willingness to get so uncomfortable because what you want to achieve is so important to you that you'll go through that discomfort. Just ask for the money. Welcome to today's episode of David vs. Goliath, a podcast dedicated to helping small businesses leverage technology to not only help them compete against their large competitors, but win. Your host is currently the CEO of Anthem Business Software, a free time Inc. 500 recipient and a serial entrepreneur with a passion to help small businesses everywhere find, serve, and keep more customers profitably. Please join me in welcoming your host, Adam DeGrade. Hey everyone, it's Adam DeGrade. It's going to be another special edition here of the David vs. Goliath podcast, where you get education, inspiration, and activation. Today we have Kelly Donahue from Agency Performance Partners, an amazing woman. You're going to love this interview, and it's going to be a ton of fun. Today's episode is brought to you by Anthem Software, where you can find, serve, and keep more customers profitably with their all-in-one solution of CRM software, marketing services that get results, and a training lab to help you grow your business. Built specifically for small business. Every business has a song. Let their software and marketing system sing yours. Visit AnthemSoftware.com for a 120-second video tour. It's going to be a lot of fun. Also, you can visit us at davidvsgoliathpodcast.com. There you can subscribe for our newsletter and apply to be on the podcast. That's right. If you have a small business and you have a story to tell, we want to hear it right here on DVG. Make sure you go fill it out. If you got a question you want me to, t- to you know, help you with your business, it's free advice. Go ahead and fill out the form at the Ask DVG section on the website. And I'll get back to you personally on it. Looking forward to it. Also, uh, coming out right now, it actually should be out at this point. I, I promoted it last week as well, too. My solo album that I've teased throughout the last several months, Adam Degrade, The Calm is out. And that's on Apple and Spotify music players all over the place. Go and search for Adam Degrade, D E G R A I D E. And you can hear a little piece of the music right now. Here's a small snippet from the album. Be sure to go download it, check it out, share it with your friends and family, and hopefully it brings you calm and peace. Well, we're not going to have that today on this episode. We're going to get fired up because we have Kelly Donahue with us. Kelly, welcome to the David versus Goliath podcast. Well, thank you for having me, Mr. Adam DeGrade. It's been a little while. It's been a hot minute, but I'm, I always look for great people to have on the podcast, and you kept coming to my mind because I've watched with admiration on the sidelines, uh, your career over the years. For the watchers and the listeners, Kelly uh, and I worked together in a past life at a company called Astonish Results. And Kelly basically ran the damn thing, even though we didn't give you the title of running the damn thing. Um, you know, you, you basically did. You're amazing. You worked in the training, client implementation, 
And uh, from that, after we sold the business, you started your own. And Agency Performance Partners was born. And basically, you are a no-nonsense, get-to-the-bottom-line gal who goes into businesses, agencies specifically, and you help them retool, refocus, adjust, uh, maybe not necessarily redo the entire thing, but try to find areas of strength, areas of weakness, and help them redirect, right? Accentuate the positive, redirect the negative. And it was always a pleasure working alongside of you and watching your career go along. So for the listeners and the and mostly viewers, by the way, this is mostly a visual podcast. So smile. There she is. <laughs> Everyone, she's smiling. Give the uh, watchers a good overview as to exactly what you do and why you're so passionate about it. Oh, well, uh, you know, kind of all started when you and I met and that crazy little company known as Astonish. And I'll just say this, if any insurance people are listening, this was before the insure tech storm that came by. And uh, we, I'd like to say we were we were the infants of insure tech and now insure tech's like fintech, a really big, crazy word out there. But you know, I think it was amazing some of the things that Adam and I learned from you and what, what you brought to the table of just really encouraging agencies to grow and have a sales process and challenging the beliefs that you had to just be a little sleepy business. So Adam single-handedly created rock stars in the industry. So I don't know if insurance agents have themselves as rock stars. You also might have single-handedly increased the sales of Robert Graham shirts for at least five to 10 years. Um, and so I hope by you the way, some of, it, some of it is still going, by the way. I see them rocking their Robert Grahams online. Yeah, I mean, definitely, if you didn't own some ownership or we have an influencer contract, you should look into that uh, for sure. But no, I mean, here's the thing. I love small businesses and the, the, the niche that we have is people who want to grow. So that is the key. And you know what, Adam, as you know, uh, working at Astonish and a lot of the high growth companies that you get to the pleasure of being a part of, growth is messy. <laughs> right? Growth has challenges. Growth has people problems. You're going to break everything in your agency or business and have to rebuild it three, four, five times. Cause as you grow, you get more people, more people, more problems. And so, you know, we like to say that agencies get the privilege of working with us because you're growing. And that means you have the problems, the good problems to have, not the bad problems. Bad problem, phone not ringing. Good problem, too much coming in. And we got to figure out how to take it and run with it. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. I mean, it's, it was a fascinating time working with that many agencies. And, and you know, I was actually with uh, talking, I interviewed Jackie Mack, as, as you know, she's gone I on. I saw that, yeah. Yeah, she's gone on to do some fun things as well, too. And I, I've been jokingly telling her that I'm going to have her on in the corner every once in a while as like the fairy godmother. She comes with like little advice <laughs> in the corner. I got to do that. It's pretty magical. So I, 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 I got to do that. But, you know, we would, you would go out in the field, right? You'd go to an agency back in those early days and you could tell the ones that were going to be successful almost immediately, right? They had, oh, the, they had the right attitude. They were not overly prideful, but they were confident and they were committed to success. And I think what happened so often is that we lamented so often that we wanted their success more than they did. And what I've discovered over the years is there's no amount of faith I can have for your business, Kelly, um, you know, other than rooting for you on the sideline type of thing. But yeah. Only the person who's running their business can make that difference. And over the years now, you've consulted hundreds, maybe even thousands at this point, considering, you know, you look at the astonished relationships as well. You know, what is the <laughs> one ingredient that you've seen where you walk into a situation and you know they're going to be successful? You can talk to that business owner and you say, ah, I've got a chance of really making a difference. What is that intangible that you find? Yeah, I mean, everything that you said, and I'll add one more log on that fire is, is that they are, they're committed to their goals for their life, for their family's lifestyle, for the legacy that they want to leave above and beyond all the discomfort that's going to take to get there. So like it may take 80 hour weeks. It may take firing your sister. It may take going ahead and saying, yes, you've had this accounting person forever, but they're doing a terrible job. So it's the willingness to get so uncomfortable because what you want to achieve is so important to you that you'll go through that discomfort. Yeah, I remember we. I would do a couple of talks. As you know, we would do the CEO groups. And uh, one of the parts of the actual talk, I would get to the end and I would say, at some point, guys, you might have the wrong person in your business, and it might be your cousin, your uncle, your brother, your nephew, 
And if if you're going to pay them just because they're family members, you're better off at not having them answer the phone, not having them actually work in the agency. Just put them just in the back. Them. Tell put them in the or, or put them in the back and tell them to research how much tea there is in China, you know, or Subway's hiring, right? So there's an application they can get that. And but it is interesting to see how difficult that can be because. When you are consulting small business, like I, I have never stopped working with small business. Like it's been my passion since I started my first company. And even Anthem today that I'm running now, we care so much about small business, but those are the difficult decisions that sometimes have to be made, right? You know, well, you might have the wrong people in the wrong seats, or you just might have the wrong people. And you know, people is one of the pillars of success in a business. What advice do you give them? Like, how do they, how do you practically help somebody that has decided they have somebody in there that they love, but they really don't belong there? How do you coach them through that? Well, I'll tell you, it's been the biggest heartbreaks in me owning my own business. You know, people that you could afford to have on when we first started, right? Because when you're scratch, you you can't afford seven figures, six figure salaries. You just you can't. You got a bootstrap, so you can afford the entry level talent, and they're very loyal. They're very good people. Doesn't mean I don't want to have a drink with them. But as the business grows, you outgrow them. Yeah. Right. And it, it is really hard because you feel, hey, I'm loyal to them. They got me to where I am. But I also know I've given them every other chance to get trained, to take the next ring, to develop, to go that next mile. And not everybody wants that. And the heartbreaking thing is, is that this is business. This isn't friendship. This isn't anything else. And sometimes you have to part ways with people that have been great to you, but they're no longer the right fit for the role. And I coach a lot of agency owners to say, think of yourself like a CEO, not an insurance agent or a small business owner, that your job is to be the steward of the resources of that business. You need to hold yourself accountable. And if you have resources that are not maximized, that are overpaid, that are not supporting everybody else, you're going to lose the rest of them. So yeah, totally. it's a hard thing to fire somebody who's been with you from the start, but they're just not cutting it. And I, I second that with you need to know the metrics of your business because the numbers don't have feelings. Yeah. So, so like, what are some of the metrics that you actually try to uncover with an agency or any small business? Yeah. I mean, I mean, I think the first thing is every job description has to have KPIs, right? Like, how are you measuring this person? doesn't matter if you're the receptionist, you got to pick up in two rings, right? Like that's a KPI. You can't let phones go to voice. Like whatever it is, there's, there's metrics for everything. It helps with clarity on the employee's end to know what's expected of them. And it helps you identify, are they doing a good job? Because I think another challenge you have in small businesses, and I think um, you'll identify with this is, you know, you're running around and there's fires burning every single day. Right. Like I'm sure in all of our emails right now, Adam, you and me, there's fires burning right there. Right. I've like, got 46,000 46, unread ones. Yeah. Perfect. So, so you're, you're, you're in a different stratosphere of where the fires are, you know? And um, exactly. the hardest part is, is that there's fires burning on every day, but there's good things that happen every day. And as again, the leader of the organization, you're a firefighter. You got to put out fires. You got to be a fire preventer, but you also have to celebrate those wins because people need to feel winning. And when you have a culture that's winning, they want to win more. It's like an addiction. When you have a culture where it's kind of like, this is broken, this is broken, this is broken, this is broken. That's right. Yeah, it is broken. We're growing. We're going to break everything. We're going to break, we're going to break windows and glass and people <laughs> and, and dishes. Everything's going to break in the next five years if you're growing. Yeah. But, but, winning, but, winning's, winning. <laughs> but you know, it's funny, whether, no matter whether you like Donald Trump or not, he had this saying that he used to say all the time, we're going to win, we're going to get sick of winning, and then we're going to win some more. And I always used to laugh at that because it's so true. Life is filled with so much garbage and business is filled with so much garbage. You got to take the time to celebrate the moments of success. Now for agency performance partners, when you started, right? Did you guys sit down and think about your own KPIs or did you kind of just say, <laughs> let's get to work? I asked this question because, you know, sometimes those of us that are really good at this stuff, we, you know, we just get to work, right? Right. Well, so <laughs> it's funny. It's just funny that you say that because, you know, I, I left a really well-paying job, at, you know, six-figure job, full benefits, everything else. Came home a day, told my husband, we'd been married for like seven minutes. And I was like, hey, I think I want to start my own company. And he's like, huh? <laughs> and I was like, I kind of like breadcrumbed it for a few months. And I kind of got him on board. And um, 
I love telling the story. Oh, I like that. You breadcrumbed it. You breadcrumbed it a little uh, yeah, bit. Yeah, well, you know, like you got to yeah. like, I think. <laughs> I like that. I like that. <laughs> um, so the f- initial metric we had was literally I would come home every day from work, working, you know, like 80 hours. And my husband would be like, did you sell something today? <laughs> and he, and he, he was, this was just me. So it was like, he was a sales coach. And I was like, I sometimes sit on the step or in my car and be like, I'm going to go in that door. And he's going to ask me if I sold something today and I didn't sell anything today. <laughs> so that was the original KPI when it was just me. But, um, you know, it, as you know, Adam, I think it's hard for small business owners to get those metrics because it's messy and it's not always clear. It depends on what systems you're using. I know you guys have a great system. Your accounting is kind of a mess because you have an entry level bookkeeper that's just really like putting stuff in QuickBooks and until you can grow and get more of a, an advanced financial perspective on things. So that was our real basic. But I do say this. I'm curious what you think. I don't think it matters if you have 10 metrics, 17 metrics, 75 you have to define winning. Just what is winning today? In early on in, at the company, I had to come home and tell my husband I sold something. That was winning. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, I, I think you said it great, right? In the beginning, it's not necessarily how many different metrics you have because you can metrics yourself to death too. Uh, but, but and half of them aren't right. Like, but the most honest. important metric in any <laughs> business is: Did you sell something today? And as you know. I've always been a big believer. One of my sayings that astonished was just ask for the money for the love of God and country. Would somebody ask somebody for the money and nobody would ever, you know, ever do it. Right. We would always talk about it. We'd hear these great phone conversations with insurance agents or any small business. I've listened to thousands of them at this point in time and only like 15% of the businesses, Kelly, after they've told people why they're so amazing say, and are we ready to do this now? Like they get to that point where they're so afraid to do it. And I can imagine that's how you felt when you came home. Now we got to take a break from our sponsor, which is Anthem Software, who makes this show possible, by the way. And they need to sell stuff all the time. Check them out right now. Here's a special message from Anthem Software. We'll be right back. Anthem Business Software System is designed to specifically help small businesses just like yours find, serve, and keep more customers profitably. We do this by providing you with the most powerful software, automations, and marketing services to help your business compete and win in this ever-changing digital world. Take a short video tour at AnthemSoftware.com. And we're back with Kelly Donahue, the magnificent, fantastic, no-nonsense uh, founder and operator and CEO of Agency Performance Partners. Now, you know, I say there's five smooth stones in business. You've got plans and goals, people, tools, process, and courage. So we've talked a little bit about your own business with your plans. Your plans were, did I sell something today? That was it. <laughs> and I'm sure today now it's progressed a little bit beyond that, you know, and then there's people. We deliver on what we sold. <laughs> and then there's people, right? So once you have plans and you're, you grow beyond yourself, right? This is where one of the greatest challenges comes in. And I was reading uh, on the sheet that you sent before the show that early on you made some poor choices in people that really impacted you. Mm-hmm. Um, and that sometimes is can be the end of a startup or the end of it. You don't have to get into details or name names, sure. but I think for the watchers and the listeners, Kelly, they would love to know, you know, what happened with those early people selections with you? What almost happened to you as a result? And most importantly, how did you rectify it? Yeah, I mean, I can sum this up into like three scenarios, right? So the first one is like, you start getting a taste of growing, so you wanna open 10 businesses, right? So. <laughs> It's like, we could have a business for that. We could have a business for that. Oh, I have the money. Let's go start a business for that. And I, I had like five or six businesses. And honestly, you couldn't, I couldn't be the type of CEO I wanted on them. So we had part, I had partners on some. And I'll tell you what, 
I, the in in retrospect, I think that it's very rare that true partnerships do amazing, right? You have to be super selective. It is, in my opinion, sometimes more important than who you select to get married to because you know, you can get, you can get married in Vegas in 10 minutes, but like getting out of rid of a business partner is actually far more complicated and far more difficult. And you have to know that you have the same vision. You have to have the same conversations. What if you get divorced? What if you get a drug problem? What if all these things happen? What if I want to go this way and you want to go that way? You know, it's, it is really difficult. So it sounds good to have business partners, but you really got to think through that. And I, we did, I, I had a lawsuit and battled out getting a business partner out of another business, not agency performance partners. And the other thing I'll tell you, you know, because I know you have a, a big small business following is you have an inclination to want to hire your friends. It's right? so true, by the way. And in some cases, that's not bad if they have proven skill sets. But in other Absolutely. cases, it can be not the best choice. No doubt about it. But you have to have boundaries, right? Like it's kind of like when you work with family as well. It's just a lot similar. It's like in agencies, we tell people you're not going to call him dad at work. You're going to call him Mark. <laughs> you know, like, and it's the same thing with friends. I'm the CEO and I'm CEO hat right now. I know your wife is, you know, sick or got kidney stones or whatever it is. But CEO here says, if that's the case, go take time off. But we need you here and we need you operating. And people don't always know, you don't, friends don't always know like your CEO side. So, I don't know if you remember when COVID hit, everybody learned what like their spouse sounded like at work because <laughs> everybody was like working at the dining room table. It's kind of like, you know, friend Kelly is much different than CEO Kelly. I can tell you that for sure, folks. I've hung out with <laughs> Kelly as a friend. She's way more serious when she's talking about work. There's no doubt about that. It's true. So that's the biggest thing they say is like, you know, you got to be careful who you hire. And, you know, again, you're the re you're the better to be a steward of the business's resources. And if you're wasting it because you have too many feelings, you know, you got to get rid of your feelings. And that's the other thing I'd say. I think the most successful business owners don't have feelings. They're sort of dead inside and, and that's OK. But you can't let your emotions take over your business decisions because they'll never they'll keep your emotions are to keep you safe. And they're not there to give you the courage, like you said, with one of your pillars. Most of the most difficult thing I ever had to do in my life, I'll never forget it, was painful, was fire one of my dear friends and business partner um, was very painful. And probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my life up to this day, because I'm not a big, I, you know, I'm not a dead inside guy. Like, I mean, I, I'm, a, you know, I'm definitely no nonsense in a lot of respects and I can definitely be cut to the chase, as you know. But if you like hang out with me and you get to know Adam a little bit, there is like a softer side to me that I find myself sometimes holding on to people a little bit too long. And I've had to give that part of the business to other people that are a little bit more, um, have a more of a stomach, I guess, for it. And that, you know, we're just going to get it done, rip the bandaid off. I'm the guy that's kind of like, you know, you talked about bread crumbing it with your husband. Yeah. I'm kind of like, you know, can we, is it possible? One more <laughs> is there, and I'd leave a Did bread we do crumb everything on the, we were yeah, supposed to do? Two years, two years later, they're still torturing me. And I'm like, oh, dear God, <laughs> you know, what have I done? But that definitely is something that's really now. In agency performance partners now, obviously since that time, and, and you're starting to build your team, continuing to build your team, I should say, um, do you find it difficult to find good people? And what is the process you're using to find them? How, do you, how are you hiring people? How do you recruit them? I mean, you're excellent at training other businesses how to train their people. How about yourself? Have you done that for yourself yet? Yeah, I'm going to tell a quick Adam DeGrade story and I'm going to answer that question. So, because I, I use this in agencies, I'm like, guys, I worked for a CEO where if he came to my desk and I couldn't recite the mission statement, he would fire me on the spot. <laughs> and people are like, what? That's crazy. I'm like, if no one knows why we're all here today, is it that crazy? It's not that crazy. And, um, and so like, I think that, you know, that goes into, there's a soft spot, but there's also the idea that we can all be great. And that was a statement to me that was like, we can all be great. This is actually silly. No one's actually going to get fired for not knowing the mission statement. We're at fault if we don't know the mission statement. And that was like the transfer of ownership, not onto the leaders, but onto each employee that they needed to take. And, and, to the, and to the point of that, Kelly, my whole point was that if no, if everybody doesn't know the mission, then everyone's making it up. And if everyone's just making it up, you're going to have massive problems, right? So if the phone rings at an agency and someone's really good at selling auto insurance, but hasn't trained the person next call that gets a call for auto insurance and they're making it up, 
one might be better than the other, but there's no consistency. So mm -hmm. that's why I've always been so big on like slogans, missions, because they're more than just that. They speak to where we're going, right? So when my new Absolutely. slogan is Anthem Software, every business has a song, let our software sing yours. Well, my software better do that because if it doesn't do that, we're, we're, we're on the wrong boat, right? Like we right. got the wrong it's captain. True. And so that's interesting. It's true, but I also thought it was brilliant because it transferred ownership to the team, right? It wasn't that somebody had to tell you and beat it into you. It was like you as an employee here have to know this and it's your responsibility to do certain things. And I think sometimes in businesses, it's so much like, well, I didn't get trained. They, everyone wants to throw fingers. It's like, no, it's real basic. But on the hiring side, I mean, honestly, like things have come together really nicely over the last year. And, and I can say very adequately that some of the team members we're going to add on over the next year, we have forward commitments on, but they're working out, you know, you know, when you when you get six figure employees, it's not just here's two weeks notice and we want to be respectful. We're all in the same industry. I can't go like crazy. Right. Yeah. Um, you got to be careful with but, that. Yeah. But I, I mean, I'm excited about it. But I'll tell you the number one recruiting strategy I tell people is this is like it is as a CEO, it's part of my job. So if I fly to North Carolina, I know three people in North Carolina that are potential and I'm dating them. Right. Like, let's go to dinner. I'm in North Carolina. I get to know their family, their friends. I want to be the first person this person calls when it's time. You're breadcrumbing them. I'm breadcrumbing them. Yeah. And, or like, I'm going to give them resources or I send them gifts. I see on Facebook, they, you know, they had an anniversary. It's like, here's a gift card. Like, I am constantly looking for the next level of talent and things because I don't really want to go on Indeed, to be honest with you. And not that there's anything wrong with that. But the team that we're building needs to have trust in the same values and things like that. And they need to get to know me and I need to know their families because great news, your butt's going to be on an airplane half the time. I don't want this to fall apart in six months because, you you know, you don't believe in the mission. And so I have like a whole roster of 25 people that I think would be good fits. And heck, if 10 or 15 percent of them work out, I'm winning, you know, that's smart. But I'm I'm a believer that the top talent isn't going to look on Indeed. Now, entry-level, mid-market, that's great. But I, I, think I, the top I was talent recently offered a job through LinkedIn. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it didn't quite pay what, you know, what I make. Oh. But you know what? It was a nice little offer that came through. I was like, oh, good. they read my page. They thought I'd be perfect for this job, apparently. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, talent, like, talent is a big, big thing. And constructing the right team with the right values and the right mission and the right work ethic is huge. So I, I don't see anything uh, uh, more important than, you know, that is taking care of the resources, the business. And so when they come on, when they come on Kelly and you find these right people, first of all, one little tip for small businesses, we've had incredible luck recently with LinkedIn. So LinkedIn mm -hmm. has made a big effort uh, to become part of the recruiting. We've had some really great talent that we've been able to source through LinkedIn. So uh, just a little tip there. Now, when you get these people on board, right, they're already naturally gifted, right? Sometimes when you have someone that comes on board that's naturally gifted, it can be great and it can also be a challenge because they have their way of doing things and you may have your way that you know you need to do the things. And do you actually role play with your own team? Do you like, I, I, can, I can imagine, I, I could just try to picture this. I'm a new, I'm a new trainer with Kelly and I've been training for years. And Kelly's like, all right, I'm going to be the insurance agent. Go. <laughs> you know? so we go even one step further. Every quarter we have, it's called a sales showdown. And so um, we fly everyone in every quarter and we get together and people who are in a sales and training consulting role have an extra day. And we actually fly clients in and they know the deal that because we put their staff through it. Right. So I'm like, you are here to torture the snot out of everybody. <laughs> um, so you call it a sales know, showdown? Sales showdown. Yeah. And there's a winner at the end, like whoever delivered the smoothest and, you know, like you, there's prizes. And so we try to like, cause you, you know, you break people down, you got to build them back up again. You got to so. bring me in one time to smash these people down. I'll have some fun with them. Oh, listen, game on. Um, but yeah, I mean, we do it and we say, Hey, we got to eat our own cooking. You can't, and you know, it's funny, a lot of people are like, I hate role playing, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, uh-huh. <laughs> but it works. So who likes role, who too. likes role playing, by the way? Nobody likes role playing. I mean, but at the end of the day, it's 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 great. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite role playing videos of all time. I wish I could show it. I wonder if I can show it. I probably can't because it's owned by NBC. There's oh. a there's a there's a scene in the office where uh Dwight Schrute was being trained 
by Michael Scott on how to do a sale over the phone. Have you ever seen that? I think I have, yeah. Oh my gosh. It is awesome. And Jim is supposed to be the client. And so Dwight's trying to sell Jim. <laughs> Dwight can't do it. You know, Michael finally does it. No, it's total nonsense. Jim buys a million dollars worth of paper. And he's like, see? <laughs> See how easy that was? Did you see how easy that was? You got to look it up. It's it's uh, The Office. It's on YouTube. Dwight Schrute being trained by Michael Scott on a sales phone call. Sa sales phone call training. It's hilarious. You got to go check it out. Anyway, I apologize. Continue. That's on. okay. I, well, we learned that from you. You still ha have all the salespeople come in and destroy each other on a Saturday. And, you know, it's funny because they all say the same thing. I never get that question. And then next week they get that question on a sales call. It's like, you know, it's the universe telling you you needed that answer. So do you actually <laughs> work with agencies and say, you know, here are the top 10 objections. Here are the top 10 answers. Uh, yeah, on pretty much everything from a cross sell to new business to prospecting. Like, you know, here, here you go. And you know what I find? Scripts are hard for a lot of people because... Like I can write a script that works for me. Like I can be kind of funny and charismatic, but there's some salespeople that are different. They say, it's your starting point. You got to make it your own, but it's unacceptable to not have it mapped out and have some script. Otherwise, Tim Sawyer always says it. People are making it up. It's crazy. It's unbelievable. So you're with Kelly Donahue, probably the smartest person right now. One of the smartest trainers in the world out there, especially if you're an insurance agent. I def def make sure you check her out and look her up. You're also with your handsome host, Adam DeGrade sure. here on the David versus Goliath podcast. We're going to take another break from another important sponsor. And then we're going to come back, switch gears, have a little fun, and then talk about my favorite subject with Kelly, which all of you who know it is, it's going to be courage. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Here's another message. Northeast Capital has an exciting new program we offer to equipment and software dealers. It provides you the appearance of a private label captive financing program. We call it Our Financial Services. Using our financial services, you can offer your customers your own financing program, including industry-specific payment calculators and unique payment options. Northeast Capital administers a private label program tailored to you and your customers' needs. Learn how we can help you reduce receivables and qualify for your own private label finance program. with Kelly Donahue. Kelly, give us a big smile and a thumbs up. Woo, look at that. It's awesome. <laughs> this has been a ton of fun. Now, Kelly, um, a couple of things. Number one, uh, you collect contracts. I actually asked you <laughs> what you collect. And this is the best answer I've ever had on DVG. So if you're ever on the show, you're going to get something that says, do you collect anything? And then people will tell me what they collect. And her first line was she collects contracts, and I punched the. I punched. I get a kick out of that. I punched my wall. I was like, "Yes, she just she collects <laughs> contracts." Exactly, because by the way, at the end, it's all it doesn't matter as long as the they have to sign on the line that is dotted, and you collect contracts. The other thing you collect is expensive red wine. Well, I just saw you were at Opus One, so 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 what do you collect? Like so, like I mean, if you do, do you actually collect? Expensive one. I was recently there. <laughs> well, that was the, that was the joke because I asked my husband Andrew. I was like, "What do we do? I collect anything other than contracts?" And he he was like, "Well, we do have a pretty nice red wine collection." I'm like, "Yeah, we do." Um, and you don't think so about I that, but that's a collection because you drink it, but it's a collection. I, you drink. It's like a consumable collection. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I go through phases where I actually stop drinking just because, like, I want the clarity and stuff like yeah, that. Who so doesn't? Kind of a, who doesn't? Yeah. Yeah. And so like, I'll go through phases. So sometimes like the wine collection, like stockpiles, cause we're like members places. It just starts coming in and I'm like, we, we have to do something about this. I guess we gotta start start drinking. Drinking again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not ready to say I'm never drinking again, but I'm also ready to say I'm, I'm going drive. for I have, a while. I have a great story to tell you about this. So in my previous life with my ex-wife, we went to Italy and we went to a wine tasting and we were there for, I don't even know how long, three hours or whatever it was. Yeah, which is a long time for a wine tasting. So now remember, we're in Italy, right? So I get this form and I'm filling out this form in Italy and I figure I'm going to buy a couple of cases. 
I get back to Florida. About a month and a half later, uh, my wife at the time, she comes in. She goes, uh, Adam? I'm like, yeah. She goes, there's a giant truck in the front of our house. I said, what do you mean? She's like, they have uh, pallets for us. <laughs> I said, pallets? She's like, yeah, they have three pallets of wine. So I didn't buy three cases, apparently, uh, Kelly. You bought I, the vineyard. <laughs> I bought the vineyard. And, it, and now I have no place to store it. This is Florida. It's 95 <laughs> degrees out. I have all this expensive red and white wine. So you know what I did? Every day I would put a case in my car and whoever I came in contact with for like That's the awesome. next year, I was just thinking of you. <laughs> That's a free wine for you because I had nowhere to put it. And, uh, and that's a true story, by the way. Very, very true story. And, uh, you know, it just tells you when you drink too much, you order stupid things. And three pallets of yeah. wine is a little too stupid. But uh, so what's well, your, what I mean, is your at favorite? at least it showed up. Yeah, it did show up. <laughs> what is your favorite red wine to drink? Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a, you know, you lived in East Greenwich, Rhode Island for a minute. And, and so like, there's some good restaurants downtown that we have like a wine box and everything with and Manny over there kind of fills this up. So I'm not one of those people who knows all the wines. There's some vine there's some in Washington state that I really like. Oh, yeah, the big yeah, yeah. Reds. yeah. But you know, the kind of the go-to, you know, is always Camus, um, which everybody, everyone loves Camus. It goes with everything. It's kind of like the easiest scenario, but we're into the big Tuscans, the big bold reds, all that stuff. So. I got a little secret for you here. It's Oh. Have you ever heard of Abacus? I have not personally, so but it looks anything in a box. Okay. So mm. Abacus is from ZD Cellars. So ZD is a great Cabernet. They have some good Chardonnays and Sauvignon Blancs as well too. I met the guy who runs it and owns it. And Abacus, what's cool about it, it's just been here for 23. I think that's 23, right? Double X. Three. Yeah, it looks like it. 23. <laughs> So what he does is that every year they make their Cabernet Sauvignon Reserve, they save a little of it, and then they create a blend the following year called Abacus. Ooh, so this is 23 years of age different Cabernet Sauvignons all blended together. And if you like expensive wine, this is very expensive. <laughs> but I bought a few of them while I was there and I saw that on the sheet and I said, oh, I got to bring it and, and help. help bring my, it in, yeah. obviously, the, obviously these guys are suffering for money, so I figured I'd promote them for free. <laughs> Here on the David versus Goliath podcast. But anyway, enough about wine. I, I could talk about it all day long. It's, it's funny because, Kelly, last week I interviewed Anthony Sabatini and we talked about the business of politics. And it got to this point, too. And his thing was wine as well. And so oh. we talked a little bit about wine in the last episode as well. Now, I want to ask you, before we get to courage, there's one, one question I'd like to ask you. You've been on the road for years. <laughs> what is the worst day you've ever had? Oh my gosh. I <laughs> I don't even, you're going to think less of me, but I'm just going to say it because I think you'll understand. So I get kind of crispy towards like December. Like it's the holidays. It's like, yeah, you're fried. Just, you're fried. You're I'm, I'm fried. Like, and it's like, like the break is coming, but I'm fried. So, you know, again, I was in one of my drinking phases at that point in time. So I was in the sky lounge and I, the flight keeps getting delayed. So, you know, every like delay, it's like, well, let's have another drink. Let's have another drink. So I'm not saying I was in my top like form. It was, a sort, I was clearly I was not halfway into form. puddle form, but I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I'm like, fine, whatever. So it looks like we're go. I go down to the gate and you know, everybody, it's like 1130 at night. Everything's in pandemonium. Everyone's going to get in at 2 a.m. No one's happy. It's Christmas time, blah, blah, blah. But like, I'm immune to this stuff because I'm like, the plane was broken. Like, I don't want to get on a broken plane. This is part of life. So I sit down next to this woman. I'm waiting to, you know, get them ready to board. And she's just going crazy. She's like hitting me. And like, I just don't like it when people touch me that I don't know. And so she's like, can you believe this? Can you believe this? And I'm like, yeah, I can. The plane was broken. And I just like put my <laughs> ear pods in and I'm like, don't talk to me. Cause like, I'm done. Like I'm, I'm done. And she's just like, this is an outrage. What I'm going to demand. I get in first class. I'm like, that's not going to work. Nope. I'm in first class, so it's just not going to work. You should just take a Xanax. Like, you should just chill, chill. So she keeps going and going and going. And she's just like, she's like, well, I, I'm, I'm outraged. And I was like, you know what? I'm sorry. I'm not going to get on this airplane. You might get my first class seat. Because if the airplane goes down, I don't want to die next to someone like you. <laughs> and I walked away. 
And based on my half in a puddle, I was like, holy, I just, I was just the biggest, rudest human. I can't go back there. And I don't know where I'm going to go because I can't get on that airplane. Yeah, so would you, so would you, you end up having to go find a whole stumble around the city? No, I went to Delta and this is why I'm such a Delta loyalist. I went to Delta and I was like, listen, I'm diamond. I did something I'm not very proud of. And I need to know how this can be settled up. And she's like, no problem. Here's a hotel room. We got you on a first class plane seat tomorrow morning. It happens to people who travel as much as you. And, you know, we appreciate So they took like great. I didn't pay for a hotel room. I didn't do anything. And I just walked away and I called my husband. I was like, I'm not coming home today. He's like, oh, is the plane not taking home? I was like, no, not exactly. I was just really rude. <laughs> <laughs> Not exactly. That's a great story. I have so many bad stories, but one of them just recently happened. We were flying back from, um, oh, where the heck were we flying from? Oh, yeah, we we're flying from California, from San Francisco. And on the way back from San Francisco, pilot comes on and says, there's a medical emergency. Uh, and so, you know. Mid-flight or on the ground? Mid-flight. So we have to land. We land in Memphis. And uh, they basically wheeled this dude that, I guess he died in the flight. It was terrible. And then they, and then everyone is basically on the flight. They keep us on the plane, and then all these people come in with hazmat suits on, saying, "Just a few minutes, we got to clean the plane." I'm saying, Sh "Should I be in a hazmat suit?" Right now? <laughs> oh, I mean, no. you know, should I? I don't like, think no on, amount, like, burner, way, like, no amount of no amount of Dr. Fauci masks are going to work in that scenario. And uh, <laughs> at the end of the day, you had all these people like we're freaking out. I mean, and then took them like 25 minutes to clean the plane. So you understand. I mean, I was on the I was on a plane that should have been uh, six hours, but for eleven. But it does. Like to your point, hey, these things happen. And you're freaked. <laughs> these things happen in life. These are true stories. This is probably the most seg the largest segment I've ever done that hasn't been about business, but it's been fun. <laughs> uh, although we can turn <laughs> well, it. It's about business, business travel. I mean, it's about business of. travel and Delta's excellent customer service. So, <laughs> in, in in closing, because we are running short on time. Um, courage, you know, I talk about it all the time. It's the, it's the stone that David used to slay that Goliath, right? He had five smooth stones in his back pocket, but courage was the most important one. And it only took one stone to do it. In your case, you know, you had a great paying job. Mm -hmm. You know, you were, you were living the life, so to speak, right? People would be like, why would you want to leave that to do what yeah. you're doing now? So number one, it's a two part question. Number one, what was the intangible for you? that gave you the courage to go out and be the amazing Kelly Donahue we've always known you to be on your own? And number two, what advice do you give to someone right now who might be in that exact scenario and it's their time to do the same thing? Yeah, it's a good question, Adam. Um, so the first thing is, there's a word that always resonates with me, which is potential. So courage might be your word, potential is mine. And I don't have kids. So like everyone's why my family. That's my not family true, by the way. You have a dog named America. You have a dog named America. That is yeah. the greatest dog name in the world. A dog named America. Anyway, continue. Well, you can do America, Miss America, Captain America. She's got all sorts of things. But um, so potential is my word. Like I don't like a lot of people say my family is my why. That's not I'm going to be honest. With, I love my husband, but he's not my why. We're sort of independent people like. We love building this life together, but I don't wake up being like, I hope I'm doing this for my husband. That sounds like a little strange. But so I think for me, when I honed in on my why, it's that if I was on my dying deathbed, my biggest regret would be not hitting my potential. And I knew I had a, something big to give into the world. And so I wanted to get out there and I knew that the, where I was, that was not, I was not going to be in a position to do that. And so I could fast forward 10, 15 years and be miserable. And you and I both know people who have great jobs, but are not living their best life, right? Totally, 100%. And sometimes the obligations of life force people into that. And I said, you know, I'm not gonna do that. What's the worst that happens? I fail and I go get a job. I'm back at the same place. Who cares, you know? And so that's kind of the what the catalyst for it all was the, I kept thinking, what happens if I don't? <laughs> like that, I'm gonna turn into a person I don't want to be. And at 32 years old, I was like, that was more terrifying to me than filing bankruptcy or, you know, whatever I would, what would have happened if I failed. Yep. That's so true. By um, the way, regret. I forget what this gentleman said. There's a few shows back, a guy named Clay Cook. If you're watching this, his episode came back, uh, came out a few weeks ago. And he said, regret. I'm going to actually look it up really quick because this is an important saying that he actually had. Give me one second, folks. Look at this. Live on the DVG podcast, Adam's doing research on his own podcast. Well, and I'll say this while Adam's looking that up, I have to give credit to Adam and Tim because 
when you guys changed direction, there was a missing piece in the industry. And I'm nowhere near where you, the, the presence you guys had, but I was able to capitalize on the fact that people missed that. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a real thing, by the way. And I wouldn't say you weren't able to meet it. I think you've exceeded it. And I've seen some of your talks and some of the things you've done. You are dynamic and fantastic. And what he said was regret is always in the risks you didn't take. Mm -hmm. And that's from Clay Cook photo a couple of weeks back. Go watch that episode. But Kelly, it's so true. Now, what advice you know for you was about reaching your potential and finding your why, right? Even Jackie Mack, a few episodes, she talked a lot about that, finding your why. What about for the person right now who's on that cusp, right? They're, they're exactly where you were and where I was at one point in my life. What advice do you have for them? You know, I think that the older you get, the harder taking risks becomes because there's more at stake, right? Like there's bigger bills and there's more kids and there's, you know, you get comfortable. But what I would always tell people is, is like, you know, you could go follow your passion nights and weekends. I think we are in a situation personally in America where like hard work is looked down on and I disagree. You know, like if you can have your job that pays all your bills and your family security and go work nights and weekends and pursue your passion until you can get up enough money to take the leap of faith. But I think if you're sitting here and you're listening to this and you're like not feeling like you where you are to be in life, you're not giving your kids the right message. You're not doing it to yourself. And guys, life is short. Who knows what could happen? What do you have? Like they're the biggest losses that you're going to have. The work, the sun's going to come up tomorrow. Go drive for Uber if you need to. Like who cares? You know? So a lot of times the perceived risks are the fact that you don't have faith and confidence in yourself. And that's where I would say start inside and, and you know, go meet five strangers, challenge yourself to do hard things every single day. It's great. Uh, you know, like put yourself in uncomfortable, say every day I'm going to do something that's not comfortable and watch after a month, after two months, after 90 days, you're going to realize I can do really uncomfortable things. That's right. And so boy, that that is a great advice from Kelly Donahue. Kelly, have you had fun here on the David versus Goliath podcast? I was looking forward to it all day. Top secretly, I actually took today off because I was traveling <laughs> a lot. So, But I, I felt like this was not work related. This was fun related. This is and fun, man. And I'll tell you, you've given amazing advice to the watchers and the few listeners. I mean, we have so many watchers versus listeners, but this has been awesome having you on. Will you come back again in the future and update us? Uh, it would be my honor and my pleasure. Is one of, I want to tell everybody, this is one of my mentors. I would not be where I am here today. And, you know, the the stuff that Adam is saying, you should listen to because he's 99.99% right. I won't give you 100%. But. <laughs> no, I've definitely been wrong. It's rare, but I have <laughs> been, I definitely have been wrong. Kelly, it's been awesome. Thank you so much. Folks, once again, an amazing episode is in the can here at the David versus Goliath podcast where you get education, inspiration, and most importantly, activation. We'll see you next week. Uh -huh.